Okay, guys, uh, I'm not going to wait any longer. Um, uh, just uh, let's look back on the week or the last couple of weeks so that we can just uh, um, start this discussion just to bring it in line with the topic of the evening. Um, obviously, you guys have seen the news. You guys have read the newspapers. You guys know about the horrific attacks that took place in the last couple of weeks where people have been killed um, because of dog attacks, uh, dog attacks and um, in particularly uh, 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 pit bull attacks. And this has led to, you know, Kusatu and the EFF asking for the breed to be banned. Um, and even sadder, it's uh, also led to the slaughter of a lot of these animals countrywide. Uh, some of these dogs have been burned to death. Some have been stoned. And a lot of these animals have been handed into the SPCA, uh, which I think is just tragic and, and very sad. Um, obviously, our hearts go out to all the families of the victims that um, died because of these dog attacks, uh, dog attacks. But then I also have to say that our hearts also go out to all the victims in South Africa, the thousands of victims of gun violence, or gun-related murders, um, the families of people that have perished on the roads, um, you know, in motor vehicle accidents, uh, specifically linked to alcohol abuse, and then obviously also people that have been victims of domestic violence and violence in general, also because of alcohol abuse. So to, to ask for the banning of a breed, of, of this, this specific dog breed, we might as well ban alcohol, we might as well ban guns and gun ownership, and we might as well ban motor vehicles, for that matter, and take away people's licenses, because the three that I just mentioned has led to hundreds of thousands of death, uh, deaths and continue to cause hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. Um, in all these instances that I just mentioned, all these horrific, horrific acts and, and, and tragedies, the common denominator are humans, human beings. And more specifically, the actions of people, whether through negligence, incompetence, um, irresponsibility, um, bad decisions or choices or criminal behavior. So to stop all these deaths from happening and to solve all these problems or issues, one would have to, I think the main, the main um, remedy would be to change the behavior of people or to change human behavior. And I think we all know that's never going to happen. That's impossible in my opinion. Um, you know, it, that's easier said than done. So what else, what else, what else is left for us to do to make sure that these things you know, stop from happening in future. And, and, and they actually, these things are actually escalating every year. So if we can't change human behavior, then what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, um, there are proposals. If I can just think of a number of ideas or proposals, uh, they all include, you know, stricter legislation or proper legislation, um, education, swift and uncompromising justice, harsher penalties. These are all things that we can force on people or on society to make sure that we stop all these things from happening in future because we're not going to change human behavior. Um, I think the probably the, 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 the worst form of human depravity that exists is cruelty towards and violence against those that are defenseless and vulnerable, including women, children, and animals. We have a moral obligation to protect those that can't protect themselves. And uh, the UIM will always support organizations and entities that do just that. Entities or organizations or people that fight for the protection of all those that I just mentioned. We will always support it. We will always support it. Um, in saying that, um, tonight's discussion is a it's a it's a sensitive topic um, for a lot of people. Um, we all love we all love animals. We're all animal lovers. We we are 
definitely against the banning of the breed. But you know what? You, 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 I think the, the, more, the important thing is to gain knowledge on the subject and to listen to people that know what they are talking about. So I will be joined by an, a panel of experts tonight that will be shedding some light on this issue and this topic. Um, these are people that represent the South African Pitbull Federation and the, one of our guest speakers will be somebody that uh, um, is involved in the investigation of dog fighting and dog fighting rings in South Africa. So I've prepared some questions for them that I will be asking them. So I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to see if I can connect them so that we can get this debate started. So if you just if you'll just give me a couple of seconds. Um, joining me will be uh, Jeanette Erasmus, the president of the South African Football Federation, um, Linz Rotenbach, um, Leander Reder, and then obviously Sean Goers. And Sean will be, uh, we will be, I will be speaking to Sean about the dog fighting, dog fighting rings, etc. Sean has got a lot of things that he has to say, and I'm going to give them, uh, give him that opportunity tonight. Good evening, Leander. Nie Leander, nie is Lindsay. Is that Lens? Yes, it is. Leander, I think we'll be connecting shortly. Skis Lens, I could get confused now the answer to what you have talked about in the previous meeting with us. Okay, here is yeah. Leander. Now. Okay, I could get quite busy with him for Leander to follow him to join. Hello, Leander. Good evening, good evening, good evening. How are we going? Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening. We're going to go, uh, we're going to wait for uh, Jeanette. Voor ons begin. Het kan. Zo kost je al een minuut of meer. I think uh, let's try and keep this conversation in English as much as possible for everyone else, because uh, this uh, video is obviously going to go viral. We're going to share it all across South Africa when we are done. So uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets the message and the information. So of course, probeer maar vanavond met die Brits, soveel as wat ons kan. Lins, Leander, while we are waiting for Jeanette, can I please ask you guys to just uh, um, introduce yourselves quickly? Just tell people who you are and wh what your positions are in the, as members of the South African Pitbull Federation. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Is it Pitbull Federation of South Africa or South African Pitbull Federation? Pitbull Federation of South Africa. Okay, my apologies. So, um, Linz, you can go quickly uh, introduce yourself and tell the people who you are and what you do. I'm Linz Rodenbach. I'm one of the spokespeople for Pitbull Federation. Part of my job is educating the public about the breed. For quite a few years, I've owned an ambassador dog, Luke. He was a, re a rescue. He survived some pretty hectic stuff. So what we've done over the years is I first mentored under Leander Jeanette, um, a very, very experienced pit bull person, and then another lady who's pretty clued up on animal law. So I went and I learned. And then what I did was took my dog out and we did TV interviews, we did school outreach. And over the years, I've learned various different things, you know, about the breed, about how to reach people. I had a lot of the laws explained to me. So my job is to speak for pit bulls. And tell me quickly, how many years experience do you have uh, with pit bulls specifically? The next year will be exactly 11 years because I got my first pit bull in 2013, but a year before that I mentored. So work on, yeah, to work on next year will be 10 years owning them. And then obviously the mentoring side of stuff. I also got to judge not only pit bulls, but I judged American bullies. And I've worked with a lot of dogs, you know, over the years. I've helped out with a lot of dogs. These dogs are everything to me. So anything okay. I could learn, any experience, any time I could work with them, I've got my hands on them. Okay. Leander? Okay, Jog. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my name, uh, I'm Leander Reeder. I've been involved with the Pitbull Federation for the last 20 years. I've owned dogs for the last 20 years. Um, my first dog was um, very well, well, he did very well in shows. I participated, um, I showed him quite a lot. Um, I also was, I was also part of the demo, demo team of the Federation for almost 10, 15 years. 
um, yes, so I got involved and most of my knowledge comes from um, what I've learned from Jeanette and the other people that was involved with the Federation. We had a lot of knowledge that came through from the American Dog Breeders Association at the time. I qualified as a judge. I, so I'm also a judge at the Federation for their confirmation shows. Um, yes, yeah, so what we did with the demonstrations, we took the dogs out, we showed people that there is a, a different side to the dogs. They can be trained, um, they, they're highly intelligent. And yeah, that was the purpose, to, to show the people that it's not a fighting dog as the media portrayed it to be. Although it's part of the history, but there is a different side to it as well. Okay, I think while we're waiting for Jeanette to join us, I'm going to start asking you guys some questions so that we don't waste any time. Um, and then when Jeanette uh, joins, I'll, I'll ask her some of the other questions, but I think you guys are more than capable enough to answer these questions. So I'm going to start off with, um, before we get into the Pitbull Federation, I think uh, let's, let's talk about the dog itself or the breed just for a bit. I think it's important that people, you know, get this information and that, uh, um, because I think there's a misconception about these dogs. And there's, that there's a misconception that has, that has existed for a number of years. So I think hopefully we'll clear that up tonight. So I think the first question that I have is, uh, what is an American Pit Bull Terrier? So I'm referring to, if you can maybe touch on its origin, um, the purpose for which it was bred, and then how are they different from, I think in particular, American Bullies? Because I think that's one breed that they uh, uh, you know, commonly get um, mixed up with. Or, uh, yeah, so... I can ask uh, either of you are welcome to answer. Um, Linz, uh, Jack, I think Leonardo. I'll think I'll start the conversation there. Lindsay can tie in with with the American bullies, but the American pit bull terrier is a breed on its own. It's got its own breed standard. Um, it has a breed registry with pedigrees that are registered. Like I said, we have shows. We have judges that that judge the dogs against the breed against the breed standard. The American Pit Bull Terrier belongs to a family of dogs known as the bull breeds, so all of whom have their origins in bull baiting, hence the bull in their names. Okay, so the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, also known as the Staffy, the Bull Terrier, the American Staffordshire Terrier, the, all these dogs have descended from old bull baiting dogs. So when bull baiting became illegal, these dogs became dog fighting dogs. The Bull Terrier fell out of favor as as a dog fighting dog and soon did the Staffordshire Terrier. But the American Pit Bull Terrier, however, they evolved into the fighting dog and it was further, further developed as a fighting dog. But in saying that, we don't agree with fighting, dog fighting is illegal. So we took that breed standard that was developed and that was actually furthered and the dog was, uh, it was, it, it's a, um, who lends help me here for, for some English. It was predisposed, no, it's, it, the dog is, is, it's an agility dog. It's very agile, it's, it's a pleaser. It's, it was created for function, okay? So the American Pit Bull Terrier is also a working dog. Um, you have to keep it busy. That's why it excels in, in all sorts of um, areas like, uh, narcotics, tracking, a lot of people use them for search and rescue. They excel in um, military and police work and help law enforcement agencies across the world. So they, they, the dog needs a purpose. And the more you, you work with a dog, the better it actually fulfills that purpose. Um, it focuses on that function and it's really, uh, the, the ability to focus makes it such a very phenomenal dog when it comes to uh, the working dog part okay so can i just ask you um before sorry sorry to mm. interrupt you so it wasn't originally bred for fighting well or it was, was it? bred for bull baiting and then dog yeah. fighting but we're talking about 80 almost 100 years ago yeah um so they started developing the the, the, the fighting dog the bull baiting dogs and eventually it, it, it spilled over to to dog fighting and then in the early, what's it, early 60s, early 70s, dog fighting became illegal. And that's why from there on, the dogs were used as working dogs. What and is bull baiting? Sorry, um, I have to ask because I've never heard that term before. <laughs> bull baiting is where um, 
in the European countries, they, they use the dogs to, to pull, um, to, to fight the bears in, in the forests. That's where the term. Yes, Lynn, please. Well, I think help. Also was a blood sport that was really popular in the UK. So what they would do is they would have a massive pit and they would bring in a bull. And we all know how potent and powerful a bull is. And what they would then do for enjoyment and sport was they would release the dogs onto these bulls and the bulls would throw them around and they would take the bull down. But this became illegal and we're talking in the 1800s. So what happened was, this is now illegal, but now blood sports were a thing. People enjoyed going to go and watch animals tear bears apart. They enjoyed watching bulls being torn apart. So what then happened was, they worked out that it was easier to hold a dog fight. You require a smaller pit, there's less yes, noise. Yes. So what they then did was they took the most animal aggressive and the most tenacious of these dogs and they started pitting them up against each other. So what would happen was you'd have two pit bulls that were fought into each other and obviously they would fight to the death back in those days. So what ended up happening was they took the dogs who showed the greatest what we call gameness and that's that willing to please even in the face of self-sacrifice. And they then bred these dogs, and they bred the dogs who fought the hardest, fought the longest, and never quit. Now, what they would, with the quitting, you never wanted a dog to quit because they, they, a lot of gambling was involved here. So bets were placed in which dog won. So a dog who quit was known as a clerk, and that dog was culled because it served no purpose. And this is where it's very important to understand the pit bull. Every breed in history, whether it be the pit bull, the Border Collie, the German Shepherd, the Basset, all of these breeds, man created for a purpose. They are not a naturally occurring phenomenon. So to develop these dogs as tenacious dog fighting dogs, they bred the dogs who fought the hardest, who fought the longest and who never quit. So what we have is say, almost two centuries of breeding in that trait of dog aggression to create the pit bull. Now, to touch on what Leander said, in modern society, it is, it's reprehensible. To fight a dog is reprehensible. But the phenomenal thing with the pit bull, and it's, what's really amazing with these dogs, is you can harness that trait of gameness, not the dog aggression, you have to accept that that's part of it. You can take that never quit, that intelligence, that agility, and you can take that dog and you can put it to work at any job, almost. I wouldn't advise them herding sheep because you won't have sheep left. But you can take a pit bull and put it into the agility ring. And that dog will, it will work hard if the dog wants to. I mean, not every dog wants to, but just like you and I don't enjoy it. These dogs are phenomenal at obedience. Now, everything that you do with your dog has to be your dog's choice. But they're an incredibly versatile breed of dog. They're easy to train. They're incredibly intelligent. They're very, agile. They're very agile dogs. They're also incredibly strong dogs. Just a very sad thing because people have tapped in on that very strong and that never quit thing. And they have other purposes. But in a modern society with acceptable work, they're great. They are really, really amazing dogs. But their brains and that speed of that, they're hardworking dogs. But we have to accept them as they are. And you cannot say to the world, well, I'll accept the pit bull for everything that's great about them, but I don't like the dog aggression, the animal aggression. I'm going to choose to ignore and I'm going to try and suppress because in the end, you're not going to win against you. And we see, and half of why these dogs are in so much trouble is people fell in love with them and it's very easy not to fall in love. A really great pit bull who doesn't show undesirable traits is one of the most affectionate happy, bouncy, lovable dogs. So it's easy to fall in love with that, but in society, we don't want to accept that there's a side to our dog that's unpleasant. So what we have is people want to deny it and say it's how you raise them. You can't say that. You can't raise herding out of a collie. You can't raise retrieving out of a Labrador, but you can manage it. And with the pit bull, you can accept the dog aggression and what comes with it. And you can manage it. These dogs are amazing. But when you don't do that and you take them to off leash dog parks and you allow them to run free on walks and on the beach, 
and they get into a situation where they have to react like a dog, they're going to do it. When two dogs bump each other and they have a disagreement, they react like dogs. The pit bull is a dog, it's a canine. So its basic behavior is that of a canine. But what sets it apart from a collie, just like a collie is different from a pit bull, is when it's breed specific behavior, that's when it gets ugly because two Labradors that bump into each other or have a disagreement, you're going to have a bit of noise or they're just going to be, okay, sorry. You have a German Shepherd and a Labbie running into each other and there might be a hole or two. When the pit bull has to react like a pit bull, it's carnage. Even the most amazing, well-socialized pit bull, when you put in a position where it has to react like a dog and behave like a dog and that breed specific behavior it, it's something that is not nice to see we have to accept okay. them for what they're not i just want to ask you are these dogs naturally more aggressive than other guard dog breeds like rottweilers and burbles etc or are they on par with those breeds or are they known to be more aggressive sorry i'm asking these questions because i don't you know i don't know any of the answers to these questions Okay, we've got to also make something clear. Dog and animal aggression and human directed aggression are two totally different things. So your burbul, let's use the burbul as a South African example because it's easy to relate to. The burbul was developed in South Africa to guard and protect farms and homesteads. It had to be a pretty tough dog and it couldn't back down and it had to show some level of human aggression. However, they're not supposed to be human aggressive when not provoked. So they are bred to guard. The pit bull was bred for dog aggression. So fighting. So it's two different types of aggression. Now, where people are getting this very mixed up is that they're not understanding that pit bulls, as I said earlier, are dogs. However, they do possess that trait of I mean, they were bred to shake and kill things. I mean, that is what they had to do. If they weren't killing a bull, they were fighting and killing their opponent. So what ends up happening is you've got a dog and all dogs behave like dogs. So you've got a pit bull and even the most amazing human tolerant, absolutely no sign of human aggression dog is going to behave like a dog when pushed. Now, what people understand is you and I, we have a disagreement, we'll exchange words if we're savages, we might punch each other, and that's human behavior. Dogs will warn and they'll warn, and a lot of people don't know and they don't understand dog behavior. They don't understand how to read their dogs. So what they do is a lot of stuff slides, and the dog does warn. Dogs do communicate, and most dogs communicate beautifully, but we miss the signs. We push that dog and push it, and this is why we say attacks don't happen out of the blue. Attacks happen, you know, it's what trigger stacking where it's one thing and the dog warns, one thing and the dog warns. And there's lots of signs and you know, signals they give. And eventually that dog, that pit bull, acts like a dog, reacts like a dog. Now, when a little one runs past and picks the dog, stands on the dog or rides on the dog, a Labrador will turn around, growl, maybe make skin contact. But it's got a soft mouth, it wasn't ever bred. But it shakes in. When we put our pit bull, even the most lovable dog, in a situation where they have to eventually react like a dog, the pit bull is going to react like a dog. And that's where it goes ugly. And I think this is what people don't understand. You know, you often hear people saying, dogs bite. And yes, all dogs do bite. All dogs do react like dogs. Whether it's a pit bull, a chihuahua, or a Labrador, they all react like dogs. But when a pit bull behaves like a dog and reacts like a dog, and he's breed specific behavior comes to the front that's where it goes ugly so no they're not more aggressive than a bull because a bull is bred for an element of human aggression the pit bull is bred for an element of dog aggression but both dogs if pushed to behave like dogs can cause absolute carnage i i've been in bull for many years my own dog also my male was a show dog he i took him out for demos and he was phenomenal. He weighed 80 kilos. He was great with kids. He was great with other animals. But I always knew that my dog was bred for a function. And if I put him in a situation where he had to act like a dog and his burbu came out to play, he would kill somebody. So 
So the secret yeah. is not about owning or about them, you know, own, or owning the most perfect dog. The secret with owning any dog and is first of all understanding the breed you own. And secondly, is protecting your dog, even if you're protecting your dog from itself and with the pit bull, you need to keep that dog safe and the people around it safe. So Lynn, sorry, I, I wanna I wanna stop you right there because that's one of the questions that I'm going to get to shortly. Um, firstly, I want to ask you guys to please tell everybody what is the, uh, the what is the Pitbull Federation all about? What do you guys do? Why do you exist? Um, what's the function of the Pitbull Federation? So can we just quickly elaborate on that, please? Okay, I think I can, if I can give, get in here, yes, Joe. The Pitbull Federation um, was established about 30 years ago, 32, 35 years ago. I'm not exactly quite sure, but it's, it's more than 30 years ago. They they started the organization when the first dogs were imported from America. Um, the organization is a breed organization, a breed specific organization. And they are, the Federation is dedicated, dedicated to the preservation and the promotion of the American Pit Bull Terrier in its original form. So we are committed to educating the public and to, to, to teach the public about the various um, aspects of the dog the good the bad how to own it what how to train it um we were a show we hosted shows as well but we stopped that in 2018 um but yes we are still continuing with the promotion of the dogs we do not register dogs ourselves we use registering organizations in south africa and we also use the american dog breeders association in america for that purpose so we are a breed organization and we we mainly focus on on the promotion of the dog the preservation and education of the breed to the public so you are a question if i can just quickly ask you it sounds to me like this is a specific breed of dog that is not suited for um inexperienced handlers is am i correct or am i exaggerating a bit not at all this is definitely a breed for uh, somebody that understands the breed what it was like lindsay said what it was bred for what its purpose you this is a, a very um it's an active breed um the, hence the work a working breed they fall under the working breed dogs um it's not the type of dog that every that that goes into an uh, an ordinary household it's because of the exceptional um training that needs to get into it it's the training is is ongoing a lot of people think that if you start training with a dog it's it's a it's a question of six months or um perhaps a year that you spend on training but it's not it's a continuation of of, of training you start off and you continue with that training because you need to keep stimulating the dog um it's a be you need to train it in a basic obedience at least because it's they are strong dogs and you need to be able to control that dog in every situation when you bring it back home and also when you take it out into the public areas yeah. um so it's definitely not the breed the type of dog for any every household out there not at all so when people when people purchase pit bulls or when they try to breed pit bulls they are acting irresponsibly if they are um, you know, not taking these precautions and not, uh, uh, am I correct? This is, this is, this is irresponsibility. This is an irresponsible, irresponsible thing to do, to take on a pit bull or to, to try and raise a pit bull when you don't have the, the know-how or when you don't have the environment that's suited to that specific dog. That is definitely correct. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, uh, next a... question. Yes, sorry. Excuse. No, no, no. no. Okay. Now I, I wanted to say that there's there's a, there's a lot of there's a, a lot of knowledge that that goes into owning this breed, and you yes. have to make sure that you do enough research to to be able to manage the breed to, properly in your household. So why is it that these dogs are so freely available then, and uh, that uh, they fall into the hands or that they land into the hands of irresponsible owners or people that are not competent enough to 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 care for these dogs or to own pit bulls? Lindsay, you can comment on that. You know what? There's a lot of factors. So before 
I think 2005, 2000, between 2005, 2007, these dogs were never in the hands of the average pet home. They weren't. Pit bulls that came into South Africa were in the hands of dog biters, and we have to acknowledge that, but also in the hands of owners who knew what they had. They weren't pet dogs. And then the Michael Vick case happened overseas. And the pit bull lobby machine was born because people saw the horror that's infli inflicted on a fighting dog. Now, if you have seen what is done to some of these dogs, it is horror. But what happened was it became unbalanced. And in order to get people, you know, to adopt these dogs and to garner public sympathy, they started telling people stories about how they were the pet for every dog home. And they weren't these monsters that, you know, in these fighting dogs, what they actually were was dogs that were poorly measured. All you had to do was raise them right and everything would be okay. And they pushed these dogs and they pushed really, really hard because obviously they wanted them adopted. So what happened was people who couldn't adopt a pit bull wanted a pit bull. I mean, here you've got all over the world, they're talking about these amazing dogs. So what happened in, and especially here in South Africa, breeders who were registered and who had kennel gap in the market. And they started breeding for the public and they made a lot of money. And we're not talking about two or three litters. We're talking about kennels full of breeding bitches that pumped out puppies. Now, what ended up happening was, you know, when profit comes in, morals generally go out the door. Yolo? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> I, I have no idea what just happened. No, I don't know either. <laughs> Yeah, I got a I got a funny suspicion there for a, for a brief second or a brief moment, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Linz. No problem. I, I almost thought somebody was trying to sabotage this discussion, but anyway, I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. fine. Okay, so uh, where were we? Okay, so we were talking about how they became popular. So what ended up yes. happening was they becoming popular people then started realizing that, hang on, these are not the breed for me. And then they started filling up shelters. And it just basically ran away with us. And we have to admit, in South Africa, we have too many pit bulls, too many poorly bred pit bulls, and not enough pit bull homes. But we have... If I of... wanted to go and buy a pit bull right now, uh, and uh, if I go to a pit bull breeder right now and I want to buy a pit bull, is there any vetting processes in place? Um, no no inspection of the premises where this dog is going to be kept or raised nothing no you know we've got to look at breeders not all breeders are created equal yeah you get three different types of breeders you get your preservation breeder and i think Leandre, i think you i think you'll be able to help me i think maybe we can count on one hand maybe one and a half hands in south yeah, africa yeah definitely not two hands even of breeders in south africa who are preservation very few breeders. Now, these people breed purely to preserve the pit bull. They breed for type, yeah. which is, type is what's, what sets a pit bull apart from pretty much any other breed and what makes a pit bull a pit bull. They breed for temperament and they breed for healthy dogs, but they breed American pit bull terriers and they know what they breed. They also don't breed for the public. And when we say we breed, they breed for the public, they're not breeding for the pet market. These breeders only ever breed a litter when they want something for their own kennel. So they very, very seldom have puppies available. And when you go to these people, they will interview you. They will basically want to know your own pedigree. They'll meet your family. They'll see your setup. They'll see how you live. They'll see your, your property. Before they yeah. even put you on the waiting list, you will be screened. They sell on contract. They will never sell you a dog to breed because a breeder who's breeding to preserve the breed and to better the breed is going to keep what they call the pick of litter back because they're breeding to add to their kennel. Not every puppy born is a breeding dog. Not every puppy yeah, born definitely. is a children. So they'll keep back the puppy that shows promise. So when you get a dog from them, you're going to be buying that dog on a sterilization contract and on an owner's contract. And the ones that the breeders I know go and make sure those dogs are sterilized. If at any point you cannot keep the dog, be it the dog becomes too much, you get evicted, you lose your job, life happens, you may not sell that dog, you may not give it to a shelter, it has to go back to the breeder and they'll take their dog back. So That's also then, part of your contract. 
yeah, yeah. You, you don't actually own the dog in the sense that it's yours and your property. You go into a car, and these people do enforce it. I know people that have gone to court over dogs. Then you get what we call your commercial breeder. Now, these are the guys who created the problem because these guys pumped out puppies with papers. And not all the time were these papers legitimate. You couldn't, they couldn't actually guarantee you that the male in kennel two is the sire of the puppies born to the female in kennel 10. But they mass breed. Now, these people also have a very limited understanding of genetics. They don't understand type. They don't really, for them, it's not about, about the breed. It's yeah. about the bottom dog. So you can go to him and he's going to tell you he's phenomenal because, and he's, a, he's legit because he's going to give you a pedigree. He'll give you papers. He'll yeah. give you papers, but it means nothing. It doesn't even guarantee yeah. you that what's on the papers is the truth. And these guys have got lots of litters available or more than one litter a year available. And they sell to whoever. Now, these are the guys that we have a problem with because these guys sold to them the worst of the worst. And that's the backyard breeder. Now, who is the backyard breeder? Backyard breeder is your next door neighbor, your cousin, your friend, the guy down the road, the guy on your WhatsApp group, pet shop owners. These are the guys who have a male and a female pit bull, absolutely no understanding about genetics, nothing. They don't understand type, they're not breeding to preserve, they are breeding to breed pit bulls. And these guys advertise on WhatsApp groups, they advertise on Facebook, they advertise, you know, they stick those photos up outside the shop, they sell them to pet shops. This is the problem because we, what people don't realize is the trait of human directed aggression, which is a trait that we don't want to see in the pit bull, in the show ring that's disqualified. We as pit bull federation, I know I have and I know Leander's done it a few times. Yeah. Where dogs come into our ring and not interested in the dogs around, but it's either gone for our legs. I had a dog jump up and lunge into my face. Luckily, I moved. We draw a line straight through your, your um, judging sheet. We yeah, and we, we, we actually ask you to leave our ring. We also note this. So this what will happen is on the, on, the, on the sheet, you know, your score sheet. We will then write their dog disqualified, showed human directed aggression. And that will go through to our admin people who actually put it on the database. So for us as Fed, we have tried really hard. And so we know about it. But now your backyard breeder couldn't care less. And with temperament being genetic, it's 70, between 65 and 70% genetic, that, that is the chances of your dog inheriting that trait if the parents have it. Now imagine you've got a male and a female both with unstable temperaments and they breed 10 puppies. Those 10 puppies are sold to 10 people who then go to the next backyard breeder who's breeding similar dogs to buy another dog. And now yeah. each of those 10 people breed 10 puppies each. Are you seeing the problem as it's growing? Okay, so some of the problems that I'm seeing now is uh, number one, this is a dog that needs uh, professional handling. Uh, people that uh, know what they are doing. Uh, this dog needs a, a proper environment because this is a dog with specific needs. Um, these dogs are too readily available to those that shouldn't own these dogs, people yeah. that are irresponsible. There's uh, irresponsible and uh, breeding practices out there that are also contributing to these problems because uh, we have to, at the end of the day, also look at the fact that, you know what, people are gonna ask and people wanna know, how do, we, how do you protect people from these dogs when they are in the hands of irresponsible owners? Is there legislation or any laws or rules in place that um, prevents things like what happened in the last four weeks? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was terrible what happened. What can you guys do or we do or people in general to make sure that this doesn't happen in future or that people are protected from these dogs or that these dogs are kept in safer environments or more, um, you know, enclosures where they can't get out and do what they did because i mean at the end of the day we all know it's not the dog's fault and i mean you have discussed you have described in, in in detail now what this breed is all about and i mean this applies to all dogs all dogs as you mentioned are bred for a specific purpose and they are animals at the end of the day so it's the it's the it's 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 this is because of human error and because of human irresponsibility but now how can we prevent this from happening in the future because my next question is going to be how do you guys intend 
on fighting this proposed ban against the breed because you guys are probably going to we're going to have to come up with solutions to this problem to, to ensure that this doesn't uh, happen again well here's where it has all gone wrong as you mentioned before we can't trust people south africa in general is a lawless country we don't like laws and rules but we do have laws we have various laws in place for this we have first of all the animals matters amendment act which covers dog bites it's a 30 year old law it's a law that makes it very clear what can happen to you if your dog bites somebody now this is enforced some say by the saps some are saying because it's part of the animals protection act it falls under the SPCA. We are saying, okay, great. While well, everybody's debating whose job it is, it still hasn't been enforced. We didn't have to get here. Had people done their jobs and enforced the Animals Matters Amendment Act, that didn't happen. Then we have various bylaws, and from municipality to municipality, it makes it very clear. You as an animal owner are responsible for that animal. Your animal can't cause harm to other people. It cannot disrupt the lives of other people. It cannot kill people, it cannot kill other animals, and there we go, bylaws. The, none of these have been enforced, and I'm very sorry to say this falls really at the feet of the people whose job it has been to enforce these laws. And you often, you know, we'll get complaints about nuisance dogs where somebody's dog is escaping and is attacking the dogs up and down the street. Now we are told it's a metro problem because bylaws, only metro police can see what they do. They don't even bother to come out. Then you have a dog who's bitten somebody. If they go to the, the SAPS to open a case, because they're told, I mean, we are telling people, open a case in terms, of, in terms of the Animals Matters Amendment Act. And these people who are victims of some of the most horrific injuries at the hands of a negligent dog owner are turned away. They're sent to the SPCA. The SPCA sends them back to the SAPS. Then we have our municipalities. we taxpayers and we ratepayers. It is their job to enforce the very bylaws that they've had gazetted. Go to your municipality and lodge a complaint and see what's done. Now, people are shouting for a breed ban, which studies have proven don't work. Who's enforcing this ban? You cannot even get lawmakers to enforce already gazetted, very effective laws when it's enforced. Who on earth is going to drive up and down to police dogs? I mean, we're also a country who's known to take bribes. I mean, it's not unknown that officials have taken money. We just have to look at state capture to know that it's very easy in this country to pay off. And at the same time, why do we want to punish really good owners? So no, bottom line is, if we're going to start stopping this, pressure needs to come, well, first of all, accountability at the feet of the owner, and pressure needs to come on the justice system, the municipalities, and the government. And you know, here's the funny thing. I know this is going to become a political mudslinging thing where people are going to say, okay, but ANC municipalities or DA municipalities or whichever right, coalition municipalities, bottom line is everyone failed because in every municipality, in every province, we are seeing maulings and we are seeing failures in enforcing the bylaws and enforcing various pieces of legislature. So then we look up to yeah. governments and say, well, what, why? Why is this happening? We've also discovered something with the storm. And it's something that has, you know, sort of taken us aback. Do you know that most people do not know how to own a dog? Most people own a dog and think that dogs think like humans. Do you know that it's been scientifically proven that a dog has basically the mental capacity of a two-year-old? Well, think... that's actually, uh, Linz, that's actually common sense. They are animals. They are not human beings. <laughs> You would think, but then you listen to dog owners who go, my dog must, my dog, you know, it's a dog, it must know. No, it's, it's, it's an animal. So we've discovered mm -hmm. that people, well, people don't actually understand dog. We've also established that most owners don't even know how to read the most basic of canine body language. Behavior. Something else that we've also got to remember is dogs in many cultures and in many sectors of society and owning animals is not a problem. Sorry, uh, yeah. we also there for Linz for Lourdes also. You know what, um, Leander, if you're going yeah. to ban the breed, 
I mean, there's actually, I mean, this the sale of drugs in South Africa is is, is banned. The yes. sale of illegal firearms in South Africa is banned, but they still continue doing it illegally. And it's and it's a thriving business. Nobody can control it. So all that's it. going to happen when you it's when exactly you what's going to happen if you yeah if you, you, you ban the if ban. You, yeah if you ban the pit bull breed, you're just creating another criminal enterprise. Yes, that is correct, and that is why the Federation has said from the start, we don't believe a breed ban will solve our problem. And also, if you look at and why do, do why are we calling for a breed ban? It, it is because of behavior. If you, yeah. and if you in, if you implement a breed ban, it actually only looks at the type of dog um, that will be the appearance, and it will yeah. not address the issue, which is aggressive dogs. So that is that is why we need to address the issue, and that the issue is the aggressive dog, and we'll only be able to do that if we regulate or stricter regulate the owning, the breeding, the rescuing, and the training mm. of these dogs. We've, and the last couple of weeks have created a massive awareness around not just the pit bull, but the power breeds as a whole. And I think that is what we need to concentrate on, is to keep on making the public aware. Uh, we need to put some um, pressure on government to, to enforce the stricter law enforcement around owning of the power breeds. Bring back the licensing of, of, of uh, uh, the power breed dogs. We've, there's various municipalities that have, that have got an existing licensing in place, but it's not being implemented. So owning a power breed dog should go hand in hand with a license because you, you need to know what you're doing. Unfortunately, exactly. that, is, that, is, that is what it's about. Like owning a firearm license. If you want to exactly. own a pit bull, you need to uh, you need to have a license. So, in other you words, you to have, have to be there has to be an inspection of your premises or the premises yes. where the, this dog is going to be kept and raised. And uh, are, are any of the, those? Are you telling me that none of those laws are in place? Are there none such laws that exist? There are there are no laws that that regulate the breeding or the owning of the dogs. The most of the municipality bylaws only states that you can, you're not allowed to own a dangerous dog, but that is a very vague classification. So, yeah. um, and most of them only states that you state that you can only own two dogs per property. So that is, so that this... is it's very basic. We can definitely look at implementing better bylaws. So the proposal for licenses to be uh, handed out to people or for people to get acquire licenses to own these animals and proper vetting processes are things that are lacking that we can drive, that we can... Yes, okay. it's definitely, it's definitely a, a, a loophole that we can, we can address and uh, we think that that will definitely um, help towards bigger regulating the breeds as such. You know, uh, something that I've picked up now in this conversation is, once again, all roads lead to government. You know, the fact that uh, that, that laws are not being enforced, the fact that uh, all these things are just, we're just pointing fingers once again at, a, at, a, at an absolute disgrace of an, an incompetent government and a, a governance system. I mean, uh, that is you true, spoke that about is... municipalities, you spoke about law enforcement and enforcing certain rules and regulations and bylaws that are not happening. But I mean, this is this applies to almost everything that's happening in South Africa that's messed up and broke. It, it unfortunately is it is a um, a common denominator across the board. Yes, all the problems that I, we are experiencing it shows and points fingers to that. Yes. Well, Leonda, the we as the UIM, I mean, we are definitely. I mean, uh, we are not going to jump on that bandwagon that the EFF is on now. Um, I think. Uh, at the end of the day, we feel and we believe that uh, the, the responsibility and fault lies at the, the feet or the hands of the people and the owners of these dogs um, and all the things that you guys mentioned on the on this discussion tonight. We don't feel it's the, the it's not it's not their fault. It's not the fault of the dogs. Um, there are laws and processes and legislation in place to ensure that things go a bit smoother and that. Some of these things can be prevented from happening in future, but these are not being enforced. So once again, it's not the it's not the fault of the animals. It's once again it's 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 government. It's, um, it's governance. The human part, yes. 
the human part exactly. So that is what we need to fix, not get rid of the breed or kill the dogs or put them out or hand them into the SPCA. We need to fix the human error. That is correct. Jock, just another thing that I can mention, if, if, if you look at the breed ban and you ban the pit bull, yeah. the irresponsible owner and, then, and, and the, the owner that is, that is forming the problem with the pit bull at the moment will just move on to the next breed of dog. Yeah. So it, the vicious circle will just continue. It will, like I said earlier on, it's not addressing the problem, the behavioral problem. Yeah. If you ban a breed, you're looking at type and not uh, the behavior of that dog. And the behavior goes hand in hand with the responsibility, responsible owner of that specific dog. So that is what we need to address. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with you. I think um, this is, uh, there's a lot that can be done and should be done, but uh, banning the breed is, yeah, that's out of the question. It's not that's the way not the to solution. go. Yes. No, it's not the solution at all. No, um, sure. I want to give Sean, I know Sean is watching, um, I want to uh, ask Sean to please send me a request so that we can add Sean to this discussion. Sean wants to just uh, say a few words and I want to ask Sean a few questions about dog fighting in South Africa because this is something that has come up now in this discussion quite, quite a lot. So, and I know Sean is uh, involved in, you know, um, investigating these dog fighting rings, etc. So, Sean, just send me a request quickly so that I can add you. I see Linz is also back. Yeah, um, I think if Lynn goes back on, then I, I think she can handle the rest of the interview further. All right. Leona, thank you very much for joining. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, you we support you guys and what you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that we can, we can get some new laws or legislation proposed in Parliament or we can, from our side, we'll drive that as well to ensure thank that you. there are proper rules structures and regulations in place to protect the people, but to also preserve the breed and protect the dogs. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much for, for, for being prepared to assist us in, in, this, in this struggle going forward. Bye, Dr. Yonda. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Islands, I see you, you experienced the same problem as I did earlier. I think it's the load shedding in the area. Hey? It's just Liz, I'm going to add Sean to this discussion quickly because uh, I want to wrap up within the next 15 minutes or so. Sean, I'm having difficulty adding you, so please send me another request because I just want to quickly touch on dog fighting as well. Um, there's a, yeah, I spoke to Sean earlier and there's a number of stuff. There's a couple of questions that I worked out with him as well that I want to ask him because I know this, this is a, uh, this is unfortunately a very big problem in South Africa. I've seen a number of documentaries on it in the past. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely shocking what's going on. You know, yeah. here's the thing. What makes it really, really bad is a lot of people jump in and all want to go and raid and bust dog fights. That's the yeah. worst thing you can do. It is a, it's, it's organized crime. And unless you are an inspector who is mandated by the court, with an organization like the NSPCA, the Animal Anti-Cruelty League, or Animal Welfare Society in some pro provinces, you actually cannot go in and raid these, these dog fights. And you'll, the people following this chat need to understand something. These are criminals. These are hardened criminals. And with dog fighting comes a lot of organized crime. So it, the best thing to do is to leave dog fighting to those who know what they're doing. We don't touch it. We want to know no part of it. It's a criminal thing that needs to be left to law enforcement. Okay. Um, Sean, welcome. Thanks for joining. Good evening, Zach. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Sean. Maybe just quickly um, uh, tell everybody uh, exactly who you are and what you're involved with and what your background is with regards to this uh, topic that we're discussing tonight. Yes. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining uh, this live. Um, uh, basically, my background, I grew up with dogs from, from the age of one years old. Um, my dad was a military man. He trained dogs in the military. And my uncle was one of South Africa's best police dog trainers. Um, and so I grew up in the environment with dogs. Um, I started with a Jack Russell and then a Staffy. And so your Staffy is very similar to uh, the pit bulls. Um, Later on, I, when I grew up and I decided I could get my own dog, I purchased a, a bull terrier. 
and that bull terrier was stolen. And it shocked me because I thought no one would steal this, this dog. But I came home one day and she was gone. And I paid a lot of money for her. I flew her up from Johannesburg. She was a pedigree. And to my horror, um, she was taken into the ghettos, dragged behind a bicycle in about 40 degree heat and sold for an 80 rand packet of tuk to dog fighters. And um, at that stage, no one could help me. Uh, the police thought I was crazy. I searched for her for about one week. And on the Friday, I got a call from uh, an ex dog fighter. And she said to me, I know where your dog is. You need to get her now because they're going to fight her on Saturday. And she's not going to make it because I never trained her as a dog fighter. And uh, so I got her back. And um, then began uh, a syndicate was operating in Faro and they were stealing bull terriers. I was uh, connected to the bull terrier club. And um, then I went on to become an animal inspector at uh, Animal Anti-Cruelty League to, um, to see how can I assist in bringing down the syndicate. And I got a lot of resistance in the beginning, uh, but I, I pushed through and I managed to get the Western Province Bull Terrier Club to come sit around the table and see how, how can we solve this problem. Because what happens is when a pit bull or a bull terrier or any of your fighting dogs get uh, picked up uh, by uh, your SPCAs or so forth, back then the, they would just be put to sleep. So, you know, um, a lot of people started contacting me to help them find their dogs because their dogs were stolen. And it was pit bulls and bull terriers. And so over a period of five years, um, I went into this and we successfully stopped the syndicate. Um, and just to bring to your attention, these were youngsters. They were the age between 14 and, and 17. And they went in school, they were on drugs, they were driving around on their bicycles during the morning areas, times to steal dogs. And I promise you, they can steal any dog. They know all the tricks in the book. And what happens is that that dog will be pulled into uh, gruesome dog fights and killed. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about dog fights, it's a very sensitive subject. I don't want to go into the details of it. I just want to, uh, the viewers, uh, if you own a pit bull, it's your responsibility to look after that dog. You know, sometimes people, um, I, I went on to, to uh, show dogs in, in the professional dog show arena, and I, I learned from the breeders. So I've got about 20, 20 years experience um, with the bull terriers. Now, um, what happens is a lot of people used to phone us, and they would tell us, I want to buy a dog from you. Uh, because I needed to protect me. And usually, if we hear that, we won't sell you a dog because it's the other way around. You need to take responsibility for your dog. You need to lock them up. And uh, you, when you leave your, your premises, you need to make sure that that dog is secured. Now, when we talk about the pit bull, um, there's been horrendous attacks, but I've been following this for many years now. And, you know, it's got much worse over the last a year. Um, and I, me and Jeanette, uh, the president, uh, we spoke about this last year this time. And I said to her, there's a storm coming. And she also said the same. And now we're in that storm. And unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, the government, I believe, is uh, to blame for this. You know, if I look at the report about a woman getting arrested, for saying, uh, you know, you must ban black people. Yes, it's a racist comment. Um, but actually, the government needs to be held responsible for this. Now, unfortunately, with all the chaos in our country, I don't see them implementing the laws that should be implemented. So my, my um, suggestion for solution here is that we need to unite. People need to unite. Um, South Africa is very much dog people. You know, and uh, what we're seeing is that pit bulls are, are being, um, you know, they've got a disposition uh, for aggression. They were bred for bull baiting and then dog fighting. Now, in America, dog fighting was banned, I think, 100 years ago or so. In Argentina, it, it, as far as I remember, it's still legal. 
But here in South Africa, it's not legal. So if, if anyone is listening and you have information, you need to pass that on to the NSPCA or the SPCA. Um, and th th we really need to uh, get, we have to take the fight to the government now. Um, because, and I believe that, you know, there's enough people in this country to make a stand for what is right concerning the things with dogs. But the whole foundation has been shaken now. And yes, it might look uh, bleak, but I believe it's good in a way because now we can rebuild it correctly. Now's the opportunity. I've been waiting for this for many years and it's, it's horrible to see kids being ripped apart and so forth. And I know people get angry, you know, I can understand to a certain extent um, why they're burning the dogs and stuff because it's horrific. You know, yeah. when I was the inspector, people got called out to, to go uh, to collect dogs that had attacked their owners. Now, and, and usually uh, it was boobles that were a problem. Now, I, was, I spent time with my uncle, he's retired now. Um, he was trained in Germany. He's a professional dog trainer. He, he's trained on diamond mines, um, in, on farms. And uh, he said to me, um, a, a pit bull cannot be used for attack training. And I agree with him. You know, back then, I sort of, I, I was on the mission that you can train them for attack, but I learned quickly by him, you cannot do that. They're not meant for that. You know, because uh, unfortunately, if it's a male, what happens with a male, uh, usually around about six months, it will challenge you for dominance. And if you don't take control, uh, well, you know, it can, it can um, attack you dominance and turn on you. Dominance has been disproved as a theory. The actual person who came up with the theory of dominance has now come out and said it actually doesn't exist. Dominance is a behavior, it's not a personality trait. The reason you don't use a pit bull for man, for man work is as I explained to you, to the, the readers and your viewers earlier, a, norm, a dog who's bred for this will bite and let go. A pit bull doesn't. Once you have sent that dog into a bite and that breed specific behavior comes out, that dog doesn't leave. That dog will not stop. You've now sent that dog to bite and his pit bulls kicked in. Now the interesting thing is, people think your males are a problem. Your females are. Your females, it's been proven scientifically, are the, when they fight, they kill the most. But a pit bull cannot be used for protection work, not because of outdated theories, but purely because when you send a, a protection dog in to take down somebody, you've got to be able to recall that dog. The minute you've sent a dog in, sent that dog onto somebody, and that dog has killed the person, that becomes a different kettle of fish. Now, a normal dog, you can release, you know, you can pull them off, you most times a bit of a choke and they come off. A pit bull, you can't. Now, people will talk about lifting their back legs up, they'll talk about spraying a can of coke up them. No, the only way you can get that dog off is to break it off with a breaking stick. So we don't use them for protection work purely because that behavior, not something we want to instill in the pit bull. The day that Lins, you send him in. Hmm. Lynn, Sean, do pit yes. bulls make good family pets? Yes, they do. You know, if you look at the Staffy, he makes an excellent family pet. He cannot be around other dogs, you know. It's how you raise them. And Lindsay's got a point, Lindsay. I just want to get to my point. I hear what you're saying, and you've said the correct things. But me as a dog trainer who's worked with military men, we train dogs, all right? The first thing is to install discipline and obedience, and you need to dominate that dog. If you're gonna have a pit bull, and you're not gonna be, um, you're not gonna uh, show that you are the leader, then uh, it's gonna become a problem. You know, with male bull terriers, I'll give you an example, Linz. If you allow male bull terrier onto your bed when it's a puppy, and it grows up, and then Outdated. you get tired, this Sorry, Lynn, did Sean speak just for a second? It becomes a problem then. And I've seen this. I've worked with them. They will bite you because they, they, you've allowed them there. So I don't want to uh, debate about that. You're entitled to your own opinion. I'm talking from personal experience. So, you know, um, I, what I'm saying is that 
uh, basic training is needed. You know, you need to install that into the dog. Like you said, Linz, and you're very right. When, when there's, if your dog can't recall and can't you do, uh, perform the out command, there's a huge problem. And that means that you didn't do your discipline correct um, with the dog, obedience training. So, you know, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, a pit bull is a different breed, right? They were bred for fighting. And we cannot promote them as family dogs, not at this time, because what we see happening is horrendous. It's not for everyone. It takes a very experienced person. When we sold bull terriers to people, we would interview them. We would follow up. We would go after six months to see, are you listening to what we're saying? And you would sign a contract with us. And if, if we feel that you are not taking care of that dog, we take it away. You know, so um, it's, you know, the pit bull, it's not for everyone. And, and Lindsay is very correct. I understand why she's saying that because of the problems that we're facing. People are promoting them as these loving uh, uh, family dogs and they're not. They have to be in the correct hands. You know, for instance, this dog, if people come to the house, sometimes we need to put him away because he's, he's, he's too much, you know, and, and it scares people. And so you have to understand them, you know, and, and that's all I'm saying, Linz. I don't want to get into a, um, a debate about, you know, um, what theory has been proved right or wrong. Um, you know, that's that each one is entitled to their own opinion. Um, but, you know, we conform to what the Federation is saying because the Federation has been the longest standing uh, uh, um, club in South Africa. And my problem is that we've got... Uh, these different pit bull clubs, and they're not conforming to one uh, unity. And this is why there's so much chaos. And you see, what happens is that these dogs, unfortunately, get sold for basically for tip money, you know, uh, as puppies, and they get bred in, in, in ghetto areas. I mean, when I used to drive into these areas, there's pit bulls on every corner. I can go now into any area, and I can virtually get a pit bull for... 50 rand, a pit bull mix, you know, and the genetics is very dangerous when you're mixing them like that. Um, you know, for instance, if you talk about a band dog, a pit bull mixed with a boot wolf, it's a lethal machine. It's a killing machine, you know. It's the same. My uncle would always tell me, Sean, the dogs with the yellow eyes, they will turn on you. So, you know, uh, you cannot uh, train a pit bull for attack training. It's been proved in, in America as well. They, they will turn on you, um, you know, so it's better to, to follow what uh, the Federation is saying concerning that, you know, I conform to what you guys are saying. I'm just talking from a dog training perspective. Sean, and tell me quickly, um, dogs that have been involved in dog fighting rings, can those dogs be rehabilitated? Um, they can, Jock. You know, I had one bull terrier that uh, was unfortunately what you call a bait dog and you know he was he was he was basically on death's door i had to beg the vets please give him just one chance and he survived that it took us about a year just to rehabilitate him because he had severe bites around the neck he was malnutritioned uh, he was severely malnutritioned and you know um that dog uh, went for me once or twice when i was trying to feed him you know, but because I understand the body language of a dog and so forth, I was able to, to not get bitten. But, you know, we had to keep him separate from all the other dogs um, because he was so traumatized. But when we started our rescue organization um, with a lady that passed on this year, um, I worked with her for about 20 years and we successfully rehomed many, many bull terriers. We only had one case where I had to take and euthanize um, because it, the dog was a biter, you know. Yeah. But I mean, we had we had the faith of, in God. We Christians, and we believed, and you know, God opened doors for us. But you know, it was very difficult with Tyson um, because he would he would never be comfortable around other dogs. You know, it all depends on the situation, on the scenario. It's a very sensitive topic. But it, yeah. in, to answer your question, in most cases, we had to euthanize dogs that were in uh, in those type of circumstances in America. I've seen documentaries where they've successfully done it. But again, when it comes to rescue, there's a lot of people, you know, they mean well, but they end up uh, doing a rescue from an emotion 
And when I was became an inspector, it was said to me, you cannot, you need to leave your emotions out of this because you put down dogs every single day. And so you have to learn to accept this, you know, you're doing the right thing for them. And that's yeah. where the balance comes in. Fortunately, in rescue work, um, I've, I've seen many cases where people have been mauled severely by their rescue dogs, you know, and so it's dangerous. Uh, we need to respect the pit bull. It has to be installed back into our community, the respect for animal, you know. Okay, so you know what, uh, Sean, I think to summarize, um, it's, it's, it's clear that, you know, all dogs for that matter are suited for specific purposes. You've got your lap dogs, you've got your farm dogs that you use uh, to work on your farms, you've got your guard dogs. I mean, dogs were bred for specific purposes. And people need to be aware of that. They need to have that knowledge. Um, when they want to buy a dog or to raise a dog, they need to know what, they, what they're letting themselves in for. Um, there should be better vetting processes to make sure that irresponsible people don't, you know, uh, get a hold of dogs that are not suited for them or the environments in which they pay to raise those dogs. And uh, obviously these rules and regulations currently in existence that need to be properly enforced to make sure that, you know, this, this doesn't get out of hand and that people don't, you know, do exactly what you are saying now, that, that these dogs become available for 50 rand a pot, you know, in, a, in any area and that the that the areas and the communities are being flooded by these dogs and that there's no regulations on breeding practices. And um, so there's a lot of things that can be done, but banning the breed is not the answer. There's a lot of other things that can be done. I mean, at the end of the day, as we said tonight, it's at the, it boils down to people at the end of the day. It's not the animal's fault, it's people. It's always people, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's human behavior that we unfortunately are never going to change. Um, so we need to make sure that, you know, we put uh, place enough pressure on government and government institutions to make sure that the laws that the laws that are there to, to get enforced and maybe come up with a few other ones, you know, just to make sure that this, this gets regulated properly. Because, I mean, you know, it's like I said, I, I'm always going to, you know, to compare this to gun ownership because a, a pit bull in the wrong hands is a deadly weapon. Same with a gun. That's why when you want to acquire a firearm license, you have to go for training, you have to get a competency certificate, and you, you can't have a criminal record and own a gun. And I think the same should apply to certain dog breeds. And unfortunately, it's the, it's the, you know, the only ones that suffer are the unfortunate victims of these attacks and the dogs themselves, um, and they are not to blame. It's in their nature to do what they do. They are dogs, they are animals at the end of the day, and people need to be held accountable for 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 these things that happen um so hopefully you know what like i said we will always support organizations and people and entities that do good for the people of south africa in any capacity um and the pitbull federation i think is doing a great job i think they've got an uphill battle but they are doing a great job and i think people need to support them because um you know what the, the, by killing these dogs and just handing them over to the SPCA and banning the breed, that's not the answer. Because like you no. said, they will eventually move on to something else. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, the, the sale of drugs are banned in South Africa. The sale of, yeah. of prostitution is banned. The sale of unlicensed firearms is banned. But that's not stopping people from still committing those crimes. And you know yeah. what? Banning the pit bull breed is only going to criminalize it. And then we're going to create another criminal enterprise. And it's going to actually be, it's actually going to get worse. Yes, 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 yes. If I may just say, Jock, um, you know, uh, if people are watching this, if you guys can please, uh, you know, jump onto the, Pit, uh, the Pitbull Federation uh, Facebook site and, you know, just like the page and follow there. If you own a Pitbull, you know, uh, it, it, the message that is coming across now from the Federation can be a bit difficult for us as dog owners to listen to, but we need to listen to it. You know, sometimes correction is really needed and we need to accept that as dog owners. You know, this is a real fight and, uh, you know, we can overcome this thing. And I think, you know, we can really set the example as South Africans um, to the rest of the world on, on how to, to look after a breed, you know, and um, that's basically, you know, 
uh, all I have to say, and please remember, if, you, if, if there's any information, report it to the NSPCA, um, any cruelty. You know, it's very important that, that people start doing that uh, so that we can start seeing a proper bus being made again. And, um, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for the info, and thank you for your insights. I really appreciate it. Linz, is there a final word from you? You know, yes. We can stop this, and all it's going to need is for pit bull owners to put their emotions aside and to just take ownership of these dogs. In the right hands, they are phenomenal pets. I mean, I'm never not going to own an American pit bull. My dog is my everything. But they are not the pet for every home. And unless you are willing to put in 10 years worth of work, at least, you're willing to have massive high walls. You're willing to accept your role and your responsibilities, not only to your dog, but to the people around you. you ne we're never going to see an end to this. You need to become the breed ambassador these dogs need. And sometimes that means having to accept the not so nice things about the pit bull. And please don't breed your dog. Yes. Thank you, Linz. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining tonight. Um, and thank you to Leanda as well. I think you guys gave us a lot of information tonight. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, people out there, when we spread this message or when we share this video, um, we're going to have some good results that, you know, that, uh, that, that comes out of the, there's, there's going to be a good outcome. I trust there will. Yeah, I, I trust that there will be a good outcome. And at the end of the day, you know what? Uh, I agree with what Sean said tonight. We need to unite in South Africa. The people you to, need to unite because uh, to, together we can achieve a lot of things. And this is one of the problems that we can overcome together and that we can uh, fix because it's, a, it's a fixable problem. Could I just say one thing? Because there seems to be a lot of confusion in society at the moment. If you have a pit bull or any dog that you're afraid of, that is proven to be a problem, or that you know you, you're not, his needs are not meeting, please surrender them, your dog, to the SPCA. And we need to back these SPCAs that are taking these dogs in. These people have raised their hands. They're not confiscating people's good dogs. They're not confiscating your pets. They are helping us to get the problem dogs out of society so we see a stop to this. And these people definitely need support. And please, if you are stuck, and you batten to find your local SPCA, inbox our Football Federation page. We will point you in the right direction. But please, guys, support the SPCAs at the moment. These guys are doing a phenomenal job, and it's not a nice job. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linz. Uh, yes, Sean. I've, I've heard about that statement, and I've realized why Lindsay responded. So I just want to, to just clear that, that up, you know. Not everyone knows how to train a dog. So, you know, when I said you've got to be dominant, that can be dangerous because, you know, you cannot go and hit your dog. And, and, and when I speak about dominance, I'm talking in a proper training way, you know, and, and yeah. it's not everyone understands that. So that's why Lindsay raised that flag is because uh, you, can, you can cause a, a bigger problem, you know. Yeah. So it's basic, basic obedience that's required and love. Same with your children. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly the same with your children. So, guys, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll revisit this topic in the near future. And then hopefully we'll have a much uh, um, happier or much, uh, yeah, conversation. And then hopefully by then we'll see some results as well out there. So, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. I'll speak to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Guys, thank you for the rest of you. Um, thank you for joining tonight. Um, I hope you found this discussion interesting. I surely did. Um, sorry I didn't give you guys an opportunity to speak tonight, but I mean, uh, obviously we had our experts on tonight to, you know, to participate in this debate and discussion. Um, next week, Wednesday, or whenever I do a live again, I will give you guys an opportunity to respond to what was said tonight. And then obviously there will be a, a new discussion uh, discussion point or topic for discussion uh, next time that I uh, next the next next time I do a live again but um, please if you have any questions or if you have any comments on this specific topic please write them down remember them for next time I'll give you guys an opportunity next time to speak and to join me um, but thank you for joining tonight uh, I know it's late um, but this was a discussion that uh, was very necessary and I think uh, I learned a lot and I, I hope you did the same um, you guys must have a 
lucky evening and remember to watch Neil's live on Friday and Fatima's live tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock. Thanks for joining guys. Have a good night and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh,